everyone welcome to this exciting panel discussion on digital innovation in the times of covid-19 well everyone these days says only one thing that this is a new normal that the world is just witnessing right uh, but you know digital technologies are also creating those tools and means for us to overcome some of the challenges that these covid-19 has really you know confronted us with to speak about uh, interesting innovations uh, that we are witnessing uh, as we live through this pandemic uh, i have with me an exciting group of people so without taking much time let me quickly introduce uh, my panelists who we have uh, mr vikas raj uh, who is the managing director of axion venture labs uh, vikas raj will broadly be speaking on the broader investment trends and adjustments to axion's process for sourcing and supporting startups in a purely virtual age welcome vikas we are also joined by marike de writer de wilt who is the founder of a blockchain startup called the fork and in this panel discussion she will be speaking about the strike to summit which is an accelerator framework meant to support entrepreneurs who are addressing key food chain problems by connecting them with key stakeholders for collaboration and partnership we are also joined by mr kriakos kuparis who he is the head of uh, the innovation acceleration program at the world food program and he will be you know using his expertise in innovation acceleration to provide insight into innovation trends in the global food security bar value chain space and finally i will be providing the audience a peek into cgr's innovation processes and how cgr especially icrisat we are supporting agripreneurs through our incubator programs and how we have actually adapted to the you know the the circumstances on account of covid hi vikas thanks for taking the time and joining this very interesting panel discussion could i you know before you start your presentation could i request you to give a slightly more detailed uh, introduction of yourself and of axion venture labs before you go ahead and make your presentation over to you uh Thank you, uh, Ron, for that introduction. I'm happy to share a little bit more about Venture Lab and 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 what I do. And maybe I'll just do that by beginning to go through uh, the slides here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, our work, how COVID has impacted that work, uh, and then I really look forward to the to the discussion with this really distinguished panel. Um, Venture Lab is a um, seed stage investor in fintech for inclusion. So we invest in early stage startups globally. that are using new technologies new business models to expand access to improve the quality of and improve the affordability of financial services for the underserved uh, and our belief is that new technologies new business models are finally making it possible to identify acquire understand and ultimately serve the 3 billion underserved consumers around the world uh the the hundreds of millions of small businesses around the world that were really previously deemed too expensive or too risky to serve um uh and this includes uh farmers smallholder farmers and their suppliers uh and i think this thesis is sort of more true than ever in the wake of in the wake of covid uh we believe that startups are sort of the initiators and testers of innovation they create products that actually matter for customers because it's the only way to get off the ground uh uh they have to actually build things that customers want uh and our job is to support those companies uh and really ultimately support the innovation uh where where it matters most we do that uh through seed stage investments uh we invest typically 4 to 500,000 at the uh at the pre a and seed levels uh, and then we get really involved with our companies and we help them get to the point where they're raising series a uh and b rounds uh scaling and serving uh serving the underserved um this is a quick snapshot of our investments to date 
we, we have a really global portfolio. Uh, our companies work in over 30 markets. We've invested in 47 companies. Uh, to call out a, a couple companies here that are focused on the ag space, we have uh, two companies in East Africa, Pula and Apollo, uh, uh, that we were the seed investors in. Uh, these are companies that are using digital. Uh, in their cases, small satellite data, uh, GPS data, uh, on the ground apps, mobile payments, to finally provide credit and insurance to low income smallholder farmers in Africa. Uh, they're really good examples of what we do. We find companies that are utilizing digital tools to serve consumers who have historically been considered uh, uh, too expensive to serve. Um, you know, we, and, and then just sort of briefly on how COVID has influenced our work in the venture industry more broadly. You know, we've been investing in the early stage for over seven years. Um, and we really do think that that work became more critical than ever over the last six months. Uh, you know, the poor and the underserved, including smallholder farmers, are at real risk. Um, um, their lives have been uh, moved uh, to increasingly be digital, increasingly remote, and they've been made more vulnerable. Um, and and that, I think that really very much applies to farmers as well, despite the fact that the agri-economy has generally continued to grow in many of the markets where the broader economy has contracted. Um, um, and 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 these consumers, these small businesses, these farmers are becoming more digital because they need to. Uh, and that means that online banking usage, digital payments usage is, is skyrocketing. And our view is that tech startups that start fundamentally digital, that build around real customer needs, that don't have bureau bureaucracy or high fixed expense burdens can really embrace this moment and continue to serve their customers, in fact, serve even more customers in a world where home visits by loan officers remain sort of impracticable. Um, uh, so real, transparent, credible digital relationships with consumers are critical, uh, and they can be leveraged to help more. And the challenge, of course, is that startups find themselves sort of inherently vulnerable in this crisis themselves. Um, they are, by and large, thinly capitalized. Uh, and so shocks to their top line, um, and which almost every company in my portfolio faced over the last six months, puts them at risk as well. Uh, and that's particularly hard, I should note, for sort of risk-taking businesses, lending businesses uh, that, that are in markets that are in moratorium or repayments have been halted, uh, just trying to get a handle on their balance sheets um, on their sort of pre-COVID loan books and building new businesses is, 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 is a big challenge that we're trying to help our companies with. Um, and finally, that shock is leading to more volatility in, the VC, in VC funding. And I, I don't want to um, say that it has stopped. In fact, we're seeing plenty of activity in the venture space uh, at our stage, um, but rounds are less predictable than they were. Um, uh, the process is less predictable than it was. Uh, certain models are definitely sort of out of favor while others are in favor. Uh, and it's really requiring a change from our perspective as a VC. Uh, you know, we can't see companies in person on the ground anymore. Um, um, we have sort of a changing uh, set of criteria, changing approach. Um, uh, and that's really required changes to our investment process. And I can talk more about that later in the panel. Uh, but that's included um, co-investing only with local partners, relying on them more for pipeline and reference checks. It's included many hours of Zoom calls with our prospective pipeline companies trying to get a sense of sort of the nuance of their relationships with their customers and amongst each other in a time where we can't be sitting in the car with them, we can't be in their offices. So looking forward to discussing, uh, discussing that more. But fundamentally, we think um, um, the financially underserved, including smallholder farmers, are more, more vulnerable than ever, uh, and that the data and distribution tools that allow fintech operators to better serve them are also more relevant than ever. Thank you, Vikas. We'll come back to you later with some questions. Now, can I request Marike de Reuter de Wilt to please uh, speak about the Strike to Summit? Marike, over to you. Thank you, Ram. Um, as you can see, I'm, uh, I'm outside in Amsterdam and there's two reasons why I'm outside. Um, first of all, I want to show you that I'm here at Amsterdam Venture Lab. So that is a connection with the previous content. And what we do here is we decentralize economies. So we're here at Science Park where, uh, well, I think it's an epicenter of, uh, of course, science and definitely of innovation. So that's one reason. But the other reason is that it's September, half September. It is, it's summary. 
uh, in the Netherlands, normally around this year, I have to be inside because it's cold. And that is the second point I want to bring across straight away, that COVID hopefully is going to accelerate innovation so we deal with eventually climate change, because I think that is the bigger, the bigger elephant in the room. Um, my name is Marika. Um, I'm the founder of uh, The New Fork. Uh, the New Fork is based here at Science Park. And what we do is we develop blockchain technologies for, uh, for agri-food. I once started with computer science at Wageningen University and really think that uh, digitization and innovation needs to hurry up if we want to meet the challenge of feeding everybody and dealing with COVID and uh, climate change. Now, I'm sure lots of you uh, are vague on what, uh, what, what blockchain is. Um, I'll, I'll give a few words on that later on. But um, what is, I think, essential about the group of people here in the whole call, so including you as a participant on the other side, is that we all believe that technology is something fundamental for agri-food. Now, the New Fork does two things with technology. One, we build technologies. Uh, we do that with a, a very strong preference. If not, um, uh, the only way we implement technology is with open blockchain uh, systems, which is different than uh, what you often hear are private closed blockchain systems. It's fundamentally very different because we believe decentralization is essential and you can only do that with an open public blockchain. So we built blockchains, but as we were doing that, we noticed that um, there's actually a lot of misunderstanding of what blockchain is. And not only blockchain, but also AI, artificial intelligence, uh, computer, uh, computer science at, at large, machine learning, all these newer technologies, they sound like very vague, uh, complex concepts in uh, the minds of agri-food people. And this is exactly the reason why we started Strike2. Two. Strike2 two is, uh, it's a summit. Uh, it's a summit that was conceived jointly with CJAR and I think most of the people in the school where we said, well, if we really want to accelerate the adoption of technology, we need to make it more understandable and need to bring it closer to the people who need to work with it. So Strike2 is a strange mixture of a hackathon, Google that if you don't know what it is, um, and an acceleration program. And we do that on three key topics. One topic is farm income, second topic is consumer trust, and the third topic is supply chain management. Because basically we believe that these three things are the ultimate issues in agri-food where we need innovation fast. Now, each of these topics, um, they, have a, they have tracks. And what we do in these tracks, we work on innovation roadmaps. And in the end, that, that, that gives an output of a very concrete plan for one year on how to start using more technology and how to start implementing technologies. And uh, yeah, we really invite everybody who's in this call and definitely your colleagues and who's in your, your, your network to join that because what we realized, we need to globalize uh, this network and we need to start working together on a more actionable basis. So in, 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 in the Netherlands, it's very common to say that stop talking and get, get to work. And in the end, that is what we wanna do. So please, if you can, uh, we have a little video, it, it came out today. So if, yeah, if you can show that, that'd be great. And that will give you a, a, a bit of an impression of where we are.
That is strike two. Uh, it's brought forward by uh, roughly 15 uh, partners and it goes from the World Bank to um, the OECD to, uh, of course, CJR, Wageningen University, uh, et cetera. And um, yeah, th the bottom line is that we really need people from the field to start working on technology. So we are keen to learn how we can make this work for you what you need to start engaging in, uh, in Strike2. Um, and the, the easiest step is, of course, to go to the website, that is strike2summit.com. And we have uh, a, spe a special app developed, uh, which is called Mighty Networks, where you can join Strike2. And that is actually where the, the magic happens, because we know that everybody's sort of overloaded with uh, yeah, digital fora, with sort of combining work life with private life. And we think to have a dedicated channel for something that is so crucial and important is, uh, yeah, is essential. So please join the bandwagon, join Strike2, and uh, yeah, let's get to work. Thank you, Marike, for telling us about the exciting Strike2 Summit. We all look forward to that. Uh, meanwhile, I have, before, I invite the next panelist to make his present, you know, to give out his presentation. Can I request that, you know, can I tell the audience that this is meant to be a very, very interactive session? Uh, so please go ahead and start typing in your questions into the chat window. Uh, and now, can I request Kiriakos Koparis to please, you know, uh, give a brief introduction about himself and speak about the innovation acceleration work uh, that he is part of. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Um, thank you to the organizers also for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, this afternoon. Yakos Kuparis, I work for the Innovation Accelerator at the World Food Program. I lead the Frontier Innovations team within the Accelerator, which is the team that explores emerging technology within the context of humanitarian assistance and food security. Um, the Innovation Accelerator was founded five years ago as the innovation hub in the World Food Program to help catalyze innovations that are sourced both internally from teams across the globe, as well as external startups. So we function as, a, as any other accelerator would in that we um, source innovations from across the globe that have an, a, a solution to World Food Program is trying to tackle globally. The first part of the acceleration uh, program is the Frontier Innovations uh, Group, which is the team that I lead. And we focus on longer time horizon, higher risk projects. So we are the, I like to say the R&D arm of the accelerator. We have an explicit focus on Frontier Tech, uh, specifically artificial intelligence, blockchain and synthetic biology. Next, we have the core acceleration program, which begins with sourcing. So we issue an innovation to solicit applications from across the globe. If your team is selected, then you are invited to participate in what used to be a five-day uh, boot camp. And obviously, that has gone virtual, one of the impacts of COVID-19, as we are all virtual currently. So the five-day virtual bootcamp will then lead teams to be eligible to apply for our SPRINT program. If selected, you are uh, eligible to receive $100,000 in equity-free funding. In addition to uh, being plugged into our extensive mentor network, receiving direct hands-on support from a project manager from our staff, and most importantly, we pair the startups or the innovators with one of our 84 country offices. It is very important for us to field test the innovations in a context that is relevant for the World Food Program. I wanna briefly um, touch upon the uh, impacts that COVID has had for, for both the World Food Program as well as the Accelerator. Uh, some of the impacts um, are not surprising at all. Uh, first, a lot of supply chains in the food systems have been disrupted and that obviously has implications for how we deliver food assistance worldwide. Secondly, our own workforce has gone virtual, which is considering we are the largest humanitarian 
So having everyone being remote that are falling ill is also particularly challenging. Last but not least, we are also having to reconfigure the way that we do deliver assistance in a way that we minimize crowds and we minimize contacts between individuals. Therefore, innovation is absolutely essential and critical to address these challenges, even more so now than it was before. Lastly, I want to mention that COVID has, uh, especially the economic impacts of COVID, have dramatically increased the number of people that need uh, support from the World Food Program and other humanitarian agencies. For example, in South Sudan, we are now serving an additional 1.6 million people that live in urban uh, areas, in addition to the 5 million people that we uh, were serving before COVID to help our limited resources reach a larger number of people um, across the globe. For the accelerator itself, we have gone completely. As of March, we have adopted our thing to be exclusively virtual, which essentially means that uh, more people can participate is no longer a restriction. However, as you all have experienced, I'm sure in the last six to eight months, virtual is definitely not the same as in-person interaction. We've also had to pivot our portfolio to help pick innovations and support innovations that tackle some of the challenges that I've just outlined. And I'm sure we'll be able to go into more details later on in the panel. So that's a very quick snapshot of the work that I do, the work that we do at the Innovation Accelerator, and most importantly, the work that we do at the World Food Program. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, thank you Kiriakos, for uh, introducing us to the exciting work that you're doing for in the World Food Program. Now, let me just go over my quick presentation. A brief introduction about myself. My name is Ram Kiran Dulipala and I am the theme leader for digital agriculture and youth at ICRISAT. And an exciting part of the job I do at ICRISAT is I'm also responsible for the digital agriculture incubator at ICRISAT, where uh, the idea is, you know, along with the research that we take around the exciting use of digital technology is in agriculture, we also have created an exclusive incubator using which we try to engage with the larger digital agriculture community and try to be uh, you know, uh, creators of the digital agriculture uh, ecosystem, so to say. So here is my quick presentation uh, about the digital innovation in times of COVID. As you can see, I have this little uh, uh, you know, animation, uh, sorry, sorry to say, a little picture to the right. This is a WhatsApp joke that was kind of going around. You know, It says, who led the digital transformation of your company? Uh, and the answer is COVID-19. Uh, and though it sounds funny, uh, a large part of it is true because look at us, you know, without, but for this COVID, we probably would have all been in beautiful Peru uh, and, you know, having this particular session. So that's a quick uh, introduction. So let me quickly go over my slides. So here is, uh, you know, what we call as iHub in ICRISAT. This is an exclusive incubator that ICRISAT created in the year 2017 to support startups that are working at the intersection of digital technologies and agriculture. Uh, since uh, its launch, uh, the iHub has been a fairly successful concept. It has attracted a lot of attention uh, of the other CGR centers and also the attention of some donors like USAID. The idea of uh, the iHub is that, you know, organizations like ICRISAT, CG centers, definitely have, you know, they can play an important role in the space of digital agriculture, but at the same time, recognizing the fact that it is actually the private sector that has the right skills and the right mix of uh, capabilities necessary to kind of foster those innovations and upscale them and ensure that the benefits of digital agriculture technologies and interventions can reach the last mile. So with this very grand objective, we launched iHub in the year 2017. And since then, iHub has done fa fantastically well. We've incubated close to 20 startups and quite a few of these startups are doing very, very well. The next slide is a very quick snapshot of some of the startups that we have incubated. These are the 20 startups. Some of these startups are doing some fantastic work, uh, you know, hitting some great numbers in terms of impact and also attracting Series A and Series B uh, funding rounds as well. Having spoken about iHub, let me just give you some thoughts on the way you know, COVID has actually impacted agriculture. 
and how you know organizations like ikrisat with the support of the startups that we have incubated are actually coping up with some of the challenges one of the primary areas of agriculture that has been impacted thanks to covid has been extension as you all know extension is a very uh, human centric and a, you know a, a, a manpower driven activity whereas in the times of covid thanks to you know the uh, the enhanced network coverage uh, thanks to as i think vikas mentioned it uh, thanks to the penetration of smartphones and uh, uh, mobile network connectivity you know organizations like ikrisat we been able to use e extension in a very effective way to the bottom of my slide you see some concrete examples of how we've used you know technology platforms from startup companies like source trace or kalgudi these are startups that are associated with our incubator and we've been able to reach our farmers who are part of our projects right so extension has been one of those areas that you know has effectively probably been impacted in a very big way on account of covid and we are using digital to kind of overcome some of these challenges the second big area in agriculture that has i think got disrupted in a very big way thanks to the covid and the uh, the you know the Uh, the lockdown restrictions is of course the input value chains i think kriyakos did mention about this briefly uh, in his presentation but here is a very interesting development back from india there is a startup called agrostar uh, which is almost you know i call them someone like an amazon for agriculture inputs see this major development where an input company like bayer they actually tied up with agrostar to deliver their products to farmers during this lockdown right i don't think this is an isolated development but i think this is indication of a broader systemic change that covid has actually caused and it will be very interesting to see that once this covid is past us how much of the systemic change uh, will probably persist and will become a very regular part of the business going forward the third big area where i think has seen very big disruptions on account of uh, covid again i think my Krayakos did mention it is again the agricultural marketing aspects. India was replete with horror stories of farmers, you know, harvesting their produce but being unable to, you know, uh, transport it to market because the spot markets where farmers used to traditionally sell their produce basically collapsed. That's where we have seen lot of interesting examples from all over India where farmers were using simple digital tools like a Facebook or a Twitter or a WhatsApp. potentially you know self aggregating the produce amongst themselves and finding potential buyers again just like input value chains i don't think this change is very very ad hoc but i think this particular momentum that farmers have actually built by themselves indicates probably is an indication of a larger change that is probably in the offing so that's a big change as far as agricultural marketing is concerned uh, you know uh, on account of covid another big area you know this is my last slide another big area which i think uh, you know thanks to covid uh, you know has seen a lot of digital innovation uh, you know emerge uh, in the context of smallholder farmers is the collectivization of farmers aided by digital tools as i probably just mentioned thanks to covid farmers were using simple communication tools like a whatsapp or you know a facebook or a twitter to basically find you know a peer to peer uh, you know were trying to you know self aggregate amongst themselves and once they were able to aggregate through these digital platforms were then systematically trying to find potential buyers right so they were trying to overcome the challenge that uh, the covid lockdown had induced in terms of finding a suitable marketplace again i don't think this is uh, an ad hoc change but i think this is this indicates a broader shift it's probably a systemic shift that we are probably going to see once covid is behind us so that was my presentation uh thank you for uh, thank you for the time and the opportunity to make this presentation now i'd like to move on uh, and engage my panelists in a in a very interesting discussion but before that let me again remind my uh, audience uh, why don't you keep your questions coming in so let me just vikas just have a few questions from the very interesting presentation that we had you did mention about uh, you know some models that are finding favor you know especially in the times of covid you you kind of mentioned about some models that are seeming to find favor and some probably that are going to get retired yeah. could you just speak to us a little bit about that model and probably also uh, tell us about why is it that these specific models are finding favor what is it about covid that has kind of leading to this particular shift in the venture capital industry um well i I, I, in terms of what is finding favor, 
I think a lot of investors like, like Venture Lab are looking out across um, uh, these markets uh, and seeing that there are sectors of the economy that are continuing to grow. Uh, there are sectors of the economy that, um, uh, that haven't shown uh, big defaults uh, or, or big uh, sort of uh, 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 insurable issues. Uh, um, and those are, and Agri I would include in that bucket. I mentioned this earlier, but you know, markets like Brazil, India, economies are expected to contract significantly this year. Um, but agri, the agri uh, sector within these economies continue to grow. So uh, for us, um, that means agri is very much a focus area. Uh, it means that there's a, th th it's a place we want to do more and more, even in this moment. We've always been interested in, in, in agri tech, agri finance, but we want to do more there. And within, uh, within Agri, uh, and I, I found your presentation fascinating, Ram, because it really touches on some of the things we're really excited about. Um, within Agri, we're really focused on, um, on sort of supply chain digitization uh, and sort of the creation of new assets, new collateral for uh, credit. Um, you know, in, in many of the markets, focusing on the first of those, in many of the markets where we invest, agri supply chains are inefficient at best, totally broken at worst. Uh, and as the world moves to digital very quickly now, we think there's huge opportunities to fix those issues, help suppliers, help farmers be more resilient. And that would have, a, has the potential to have massive impacts on these individuals and these economies. I, you guys uh, know these statistics far better than I do, but you know, focusing in on Africa where we have our two investments so far, smallholder farmers provide 80% of food supply. Uh, they're hi highly vulnerable, but in most um, uh, African markets, micro insurance is sub 5% kinds of penetration, just as droughts are increasing due to climate change. So uh, th there's massive vulnerability, there's massive risk. The countervailing force here is that is technology. It's that 91% of Kenya uses mobile money. Uh, so insurance premiums or loan repayments are much easier to pay and collect. Uh, there's incredibly now accurate and cheap small satellite data and GPS data. Uh, that means that lenders and insurers can make more accurate underwriting decisions, uh, more, more instant claim decisions. So, um, um, you know, we can figure out ways to insure farmers using technology like Pula does in Africa, uh, make them less susceptible to climate shocks, uh, and we can go a long way towards making them live better, more more secure lives. Yeah. Can, oh, can, can I add a, a question maybe to that? Or, please. Uh, yeah. please, go ahead. So, so, so to what extent is um, traceability a topic? Because if I talk about uh, blockchain, blockchain, blockchain basically delivers flawless, cheap, complete traceability. And what we've, what we've noticed ourselves is that in, uh, when COVID kicked in, our turnover dropped by 88%, but it's picking up madly now because um, what we feel is that people realize that there is an opportunity, there is an importance of knowing where, you know, provenance, where food comes from, but definitely there's also an increase in consumer demands for uh, knowing what, what, what you're putting inside. So, so how do you see that? What, what's your, your take on that? How big is traceability in, in sort of ag tech? Um, it's, it's been a feature, but not necessarily the fundamental driver of some of the models that we found really exciting. Like I said, it's, it's it, you know, as you move from uh, um, seed manufacturer to consumer of, 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 a, of, of food, um, there's a lot of room for uh, innovation. There's a lot of room for digitization. There's a lot of room for better tracking. Um, and we've, we've really been excited about businesses that are figuring out multiple points along that, including saying, hey, uh, at, at a restaurant or when I'm at the grocery store, I can better identify where this, yeah. where this food came from. Uh, I know uh, that it didn't have pesticides. I know that it... Exactly. Um, uh, yeah. I know that the per that there's fewer links in the supply chain to get to me, so I know the farmer might actually, uh, uh, as I continue to consume through this uh, revised chain, actually see more value. That we 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 really we really like that. I think the the links of the chain that we are more focused on right now are really supplier and farmer, uh, uh, and it so it's for suppliers. And Ram sort of right. touched on this earlier. It is hey, how do I order seed fertilizer more efficiently? How do I do it digitally? Um, how do I make sure that's higher quality? 
just that first link, um, um, mm. and that has implications. Because down the that, chain. that's where the where you see the weakest link. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, well, I see the, the, there are weak links uh, throughout, um, um, but that's that's a place where uh, I think there is a it's low hanging fruit uh, in terms of uh, of digitizing. It's essentially putting these small businesses that are retailers uh, uh, making them e commerce uh, uh, and making allowing them to buy. Um, but yeah, we, we we look. We'd love to see more and more models that are that are streamlining and tracking throughout the throughout the chain. Yeah, it's interesting, and really it's my final. Of... Go ahead. Yeah, just a final point because I, I really it, I find that fascinating because we actually think it's the opposite. We think huh. at at sort of farm level and input level, we have very strong players. We have it pretty well organized. Um, if you see uh, the, the 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 yield growth over the past uh, well decades, and of course there's a lot to gain still in 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 regions where the yield gap is still very prominent. But overall, that's a pretty strong part of the supply chain. Whereas we think that where the weak link is, it's really at the consumer side because the consumer has no idea what their impact is of their food consumption on the planet. I think yeah. it depends where you are. I, at, at least at the World Food Program, at the accelerator specifically, we've seen a lot more applications come in for traceability. But uh, the way that they, they present the value add is more for the farmer. So if, if a European consumer is willing to pay more for a product because they know the provenance of it, then yeah. the farmer ends up getting a higher cut of the price. So yeah. I think... I think for for a lot of the emerging markets, it's more about the as I think Vitas was was uh, hinting at. It's more at the farm level, and how can we um, empower, enable uh, farmers uh, to either reap a higher benefit from that traceability, or connect with the right input suppliers so that they can increase their productivity. Of course, those both are very quite complementary. Great, thank you for the response. Uh, let me just pick there, uh, Maria can, let me go to Kriakos. Uh, I was reading up about the World Food Program Accelerator, you know, like incubation and acceleration programs today, you'd probably agree, you know, these are very systemized, you know, any acceleration program will have like a set of five or six programs. But Kriakos, what I really found attracting about, attractive about the World Food Program is you added access to World Food Program operations, right? In some ways, at iHub, this is also what we try to do. We try to open up a bit of ICRISAT's activity on the ground, uh, and we try to embed some of our startups and some of their digital into innovations into you know, the mainstream of ICRISAT act activities. Uh, I really kind of couldn't agree more, but perhaps you could speak a bit about that particular aspect of your acceleration program, uh, and you know, uh, maybe we'll pick it from there. Of course. So um, if I may uh, reflect on what you said, essentially, how do we as an accelerator embed ourselves and, and the startups and the work that we do within the broader context of the World Food Program? Um, that's an excellent question. And in fact, uh, that's one of our selling points. The World Food Program has country offices in 84 countries. We are an organization of 18,000 people. We have an annual budget of $8 billion and we serve approximately 100 million beneficiaries worldwide. So as an innovation accelerator, we want to catalyze innovation within the entire organization. And we want to help our colleagues who are working very hard every day to make sure that people have uh, life-saving assistance to innovate. And, and, and you know, our director actually likes to say all the time, that we don't have one innovation hub, we have 84 innovation hubs, meaning a food program. Because really when you are an operational organization, you have to innovate on a day-to-day -day basis. And it might not be um, buzzwords or fancy tech, but it's essentially delivering more value with the same or fewer resources, which I think is definitional of innovation. Um, at, the, at the accelerator specifically, we try to balance our portfolio so that it's looking at innovations that would make WFP have a larger impact, become more efficient, save costs, reach more people. But also, we look at innovations that address the root causes of food insecurity. So how do we support smallholder farmers? How do we look at livelihoods? How do we help countries um, adapt to climate change and the many impacts that that will entail? 
So we do try to have a balanced approach between making WFP a stronger organization, as well as trying to tackle some of the root causes uh, of food insecurity. There is um, more digital data and more digital uh, distribution points. This is a part of the economy that's actually growing when the rest of the economy is contracting. And more, most importantly, there is a massive and increasing need amongst farmers and the poor around the world. So um, if, if those three uh, uh, reasons are, are, are not enough, I don't know what to tell you. I think this is, this is the time to be working in this space uh, uh, and there's a lot of opportunity. Great, thanks Vikas. Marike, quick, quick last minute yeah. comments. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So, so blockchain is uh, is a newer generation of technologies. It's part of the the next industrial revolution, and the, the key word in there is decentralization. And we need to have a more decentralized world. That is going to create a more robust world because we will never get post COVID. COVID is here, it will, it will stay here. We will have a next COVID and another one and another one. So if mm. anything, um, please do get your head into what means, uh, what, 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 what decentralization means and what you can do to make your direct world more decentralized. Great, thank you. Kritos, how about you? Um, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with what Vikas is saying, that there's a lot of opportunity in, in this particular crisis. And I think innovation uh, is even more critical than it was before. Um, sometimes in, in humanitarian contexts or in the development sector, innovation is considered as a nice to have, but I, I definitely would argue that it's actually imperative. It was imperative before, and it's absolutely today as the challenges have multiplied and as our resources are stretched even further. So sure. dig digitalization is not the end all and be all, but it'll definitely. And as you mentioned in your own opening remarks, we've seen an exponential growth and shift in digital in, in many aspects of, of agriculture and specifically within the humanitarian sure. sector as well. Great. So there it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's the closing remarks. I think the the opinion from all the panelists is, you know, it says we are all in for an exciting ride.